worked at 4 Z Radio while he was at uni, took him to remote Northwest WA with the ABC and then back east where he worked for Triple J's current affairs show Hack. He's also hosted the ABC podcast The Signal, worked in commercial radio for the University of Queensland and the library. He's recently returned to 4 Z as the station manager, but he's still trying to make podcasts and maintain a garden of native plants in his spare time. So welcome, Stephen, and welcome, Tom Tilly. Yeah. It didn't occur to me that when I wrote that last night, there was going to be read out. <laughs> so thank you for bearing with us. Um, yeah, well, this is Tom Tilly. Um, I've known Tom for almost 10 years now. Well, it's more than 10 years, yeah. 2010. Um, so Tom, as you may be aware, uh, hosted the uh, current affairs program on HACT called, or on Triple Jack called HACT. Um, was a journalist in the ABC before that, now hosts the briefing. Yeah. Had a wonderful, uh, wonderful podcast, so well done. That sounded great. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you've written a book, which is lovely. Yeah. Um, thanks everyone for coming down, by the way. It's really nice of you to turn out on this um, rainy night. And um, yeah, thank you interest in this book, which is... Um, if you've had a look at it by now, um, excruciatingly personal. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, the thing that I found really interesting about it, and we were just talking about this before, like, I've known you for more than 10 years. We met yeah. in 2010, I think, when I was at Triple Z, and you had maybe just like, done a student hosting act or something. Yeah, early uh, days. Yeah, yeah you, it was on like two yeah. Um And I'd, like then a few years later, I started working back, so we spent a lot of time together. Um, well, physically together on phone calls every morning. <laughs> Um, where you did some ideas yeah, and yeah. then you do your ideas, yeah. um, which is fun. Um, but the thing that I always found wonderful, and I think the thing that probably a lot of you might share with you is that I know the Tom Tilly from Act on Triple J. Um, my the explanation of you, I don't think we've ever really spoken about what you've done before you started working. Um, when I speak to other people, it's like, oh, yeah, Tom, like, had a pretty conservative upbringing, you know. Was it like was it Christian? Like, it wasn't even like you were a part of a you know pretty small Christian sect. You were a Christian, and then you know that was it. And then that sort of kind of like blew the base of it. Um, and so reading the book, you get this whole other experience of who you are, mm. which is great. Um, and the thing I want to start with though, because this is the Tom Tilly that I know. Like, give us a week in your life in 2016. 2016, I was living the dream. So, um, you know, I was well and truly comfortable in my dream job hosting Hack. Um, there was an election that year. It was the um, the one where Turnbull just hang on after ousting Abbott. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. I voted at a, a polling booth at Threadbo that year, so I was down there skinny. Um, I'd somehow landed up in my, um, both aesthetically and musically, um, and in many other ways, my dream band, Client Liaison, which um, embraced all things sort of 80s, Pascal and um, Bumpy, which wasn't, you know, um, appreciated as much as Triple J, but these these guys really, really dug the kind of sound I was into and somehow I ended up the bass player in this band. So um, a typical week then was going and doing the serious stuff Monday to Friday, getting on conference call with you and the team every morning at 10 o'clock and having a pretty serious chat, rounding out what the best ideas were for the day, doing the show. And then sometimes on the, the Thursday or the Friday night, I'd uh, get out of the studio and run as fast as I could to the train station to get to the airport to go play a gig, play three gigs over the weekend and then turn up for Hack on Monday, trying to focus again. I remember, this is a wonderful behind the curtain moment, I think it was the last show of the year and we pre-recorded the last 10 minutes so you could leave early. Yeah. <laughs> I got a bit of flexibility towards the end. Um, but yeah, you know, if the, if the flight was at 6.35 and you want to you're finishing hack at 6, it's like cutting it pretty fine. And one time I actually got um, Simon Marnie, the ABC presenter, who we became friends and he was down at the adult station. I was up on level 6 of the children's network. And um, we... Pre recorded the last five minutes of the show, all the heartfelt thank yous. It was the final show of the year. And he was waiting outside the, the glass sliding doors of the ABC on his scooter, ready to yeah. race me to the airport to get on a flight to go to a gig. So, um, yeah, it was pretty pretty fun. Other times, I, we played Splendor in the Grass, and the only way I could get to the airport was borrowing a friend's postie. So, I, I strapped my bass guitar on the back of a postie and drove down to the airport. <laughs> And flew up to Splendor in the Grass. So, yeah, it was like, I was like, it was a ridiculously beautiful 
fast paced um, time. And I was asking questions about sort of what next, but then I was um, completely getting them and getting on with it. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, through this whole period, like I've known you, and again, like the explanation of Tom Kelly was, yeah, Christian background. Um, you're a few years older than me. Um, and so, like, and you would party like party harder than I would. Um, so I like did all my party in my like early twenties, and then I started working triple J. And Tom was just going harder. Well. Um, by the time I was like, "Man, this guy's going on." Um, and the explanation, yeah, just, you know, just had an upbringing. So until I read this, I had no comprehension of how like how conservative it was. Mm. Um, you kind of you basically grew up, were born into this church called the Revival Center, so this Christian center mm. called the Revival Center. Um, from like what kind of from what age, like from what moment were you there? Um, well, my parents um, came to be part of this church a couple of years before I was born. So they met inside the church, dad from Adelaide, mum from Dubbo, Wellington, country New South Wales. And um, yeah, they met in this church full of exciting young people. And while the rules and the lifestyle were very conservative, it was actually a fairly out there solution. Um, you know, it wasn't sort of like standard Anglican, Catholic and church. These people all believed that you had to have this um, spiritual experience, it's physical spiritual experience of speaking in tongues, an unknown language that God has given you that you're just spraying out of your mouth in this direct communication. <laughs> they believed that you had to have that to be saved. Mm -hmm. So my parents, who mum had a really interesting backstory, she, you know, grown up on a nice farm and then traveled the world with the hippies and, you know, opium, um, you know, hashish, traveling through the Middle East. Dad had lived in Arnhem Land and been in the army and um, been surfing and a bunch of stuff, but they both got to a later stage and it sort of, they felt like they needed something more and they, they landed on this solution through various sort of uh, people in their lives that brought them into it. So. That's the, that's the environment I grew up in. So they were these young people who joined this church and they all started getting married and having kids. And we just grew up in this, it, it initially just seemed great. We just had, you know, three or four nights a week of get togethers at the church hall, people's houses, out on the riverbanks, camping, traveling away. Um, and we just had dozens of ready-made best friends and um, it just was a lot of fun, basically. I think you're kind of underselling, you know, I mean, at that point, I guess it was pretty important to you, but like the thing that found, I found fascinating about it is just how conservative this church ended up. Mm. Like, it, it's, I mean, it starts out big, so, yeah. but it really does get pretty hectic. You know? yeah. Like, what are some of the rules that you were living by? Yeah, so you sort of don't notice them as you're, you know, five, six, seven. You just know that you're in a sort of a tight group and you know that people are either inside of it or outside of it. And that's, oh, uh, my parents don't drink like other parents or um, you sort of start to notice these little things and then that sort of um, becomes even more apparent as your friends hit their teenage years and start to get pretty wild. Um, you know, friends like Anthony Gooley, who's here tonight, start to really, um, you know, unleash and you know that you're not allowed to do that. So it sort of starts with not drinking. You're not allowed to have a girlfriend until you're 17. Oh, and she, she has to be from the church. Um, and then it sort of goes up a, a little notch. And um, when I was 14, um, the church came in with a new rule. There was this big meeting of all the head pastors. Um, they all travelled to Sydney. And the guy who founded the church in 1958 said, we're changing the policy on fornication. Um, <laughs> great words. Yeah, I mean, it tells you a lot that they use the word fornication. As well. yeah. That was the real red flag for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like... <laughs> It's not as bad as the word sodomy, but it's like <laughs> in terms of like outdated language. <laughs> Fornication. They really threw it around too. <laughs> Lots of consonants. Um, yeah, so they changed the rule. Fornication meant a lifetime ban. And some of the pastors stood up and went, no. Nah. This is going a step too far. This is not how we interpret the book of Corinthians, where this policy was sort of drawn from, and we are going to step aside. And my dad, who's retelling me the story after coming back from this meeting, sort of said, like, I like a lot of those guys, but he sort of saw them as rebels to the founder of the church. And, you know, I was only 14, so 
at that stage, I didn't want to fornicate. I actually liked the idea of saving myself to a marriage. I was like, that's beautiful. I mean, I mean, imagine those all those people who have to have that awkward conversation when they get married about who else they slept with. I don't I like to keep it pure, like I was kind of sold. Um, but yeah, dad, dad took the hard line and chose to stick in the, the branch of the church um, that had this uh, fairly fairly clear fornication policy. And uh, and then it got it, it just then that split the church in half. So it was the revival centers of Australia. The, the Rebel League became the Revival Fellowship. And ours became, we had to sort of find a way to sell it. So they called it Revival Centres International. Yeah, you got the Judaeans people front and then the people front of Judea. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And this happens a lot in Pentecostal churches. There's lots of denomination splits. And that's because it doesn't have the hierarchy the structure um, of the older denominations. Um, it's a lot more any, any man and his dog. Um, can start up their own their own church in that movement. Um, and then we started going to these camps with the older kids, so from year 10 into their people into their 30s, youngies camps. And when the rules got a bit stricter, they started bringing this, um, this wonderful Saturday afternoon activity called the Morals Talk. <laughs> so um, they had a sort of a bifold, eight four piece of paper with the guidelines, and then suddenly it was like it was there in black and white, and we it was a lot stricter. Um, so it really spelled out from, from, from fornication at the most extreme all the way back to uh, rebellious haircuts or, you know, um, T-shirts with dangerous um, ideas or like, um, yeah, it got pretty insane. No, no, park, no spending time in parked cars with members of the opposite sex. Um, yeah. yeah, that kind of That's stuff. Safe. Yeah. yeah, good moment. I was sort of, sorry about that, yeah. No um, dancing on that. <laughs> and this is... There's, you know, this is obviously, now you look back at that and you're like, oh, just kind of pretty weird. And there's that pressure to, you know, pressure to not misbehave in that sense. Yeah. But also, like, you know, you're talking about speaking in tongues and that's the whole, that's the title of the book. Mm. Um, so it's the bingo kind of part of it. Um, and that idea that you've been the, like, you know, that's your, that's kind of the, you've been touched by God at that point of view, yeah. effectively. Yeah. Um, and there's this, this kind of guilt that goes along with that. Like if you have, and it's such a central part of the whole church's teachings that if you haven't had that, yeah, there's this kind of big guilt that's weighing on you at the same time. So you've got this guilt that's weighing and you're like, oh like am I actually supposed to be part of this? Am I yeah. faith? Like have I got enough faith in this? And at the same time there's that pressure coming from the other side. Yeah, that's right. You've got the world on one side that you sort of want to be a part of and you want to be close with your friends and be normal. Like I I just didn't I wasn't someone that wanted to be different. And I found this, as I got older, I started to find this embarrassing. So that was the sort of navigation at school and then in the church life. And they, they actually stayed relatively separate. Um, yeah, initially it was like, what if I don't receive the Holy Spirit? And so they they brought it on pretty early, like six, seven, eight years old. They're getting kids into these prayer meetings, these seekers meetings. All right. It's, what you do, yeah. it's also like a big part of the gatherings as well. Like you're going to these church, or you're going to you're seeing the adults do it. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Or when people get baptized, they, they they speak out in tongues. And then so then the kids are starting to starting to get brought in. All right, we're all going to get down on our knees for the next half an hour before before bedtime at kids' camp or after a Sunday meeting. And you'll um so what you do is you repeat the word hallelujah or just say a few prayers to God in English and just keep repeating it. And when when God decides he's ready, you will have this, the spirit will come up inside you. And we've heard all these stories at every meeting, the adults, two or three of them would get up and share their experience at this moment because it defined their salvation. And they gave all these dramatic explanations. Like my dad was like, my, my body felt like it rose up to the ceiling. And I looked down on the congregation as like the spirit moved inside of me or people would say that they this warm rush from their feet all the way up through their body and then it poured out through their mouth. So you're an eight-year-old guy. My mind's that good. <laughs> <laughs> what if it's shit? <laughs> and my, my, my experience, 10 years old, I'm in this um, beat-up old scouts um, cabin down the south coast of the kids' camp. I thought it was the moment, um, but it wasn't that good. <laughs> and that planted the seed of doubt that started to that just that just sat in the back of my brain 
for the rest of my life. Mm. And you've got a decent sized family as well. So yeah. You've got, yeah, four boys. Exactly, and two parents. Yeah. They count. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and your younger brother, Sam, as yeah. well. So there's this, you know, obviously your, your dad's got that story, but your, your brother as well. Yeah. Like he, he received his gift before you did. He was seven. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. And this is the thing that gets, like, I'm, I'm going to be like very open. I'm like, yeah. a, I'm an agnostic person, a, towards, like very lean towards atheism. Um, and like, I have strong doubts. Mm. Have you ever spoken to him about it? My brother? Yeah. So when I finished writing the book, I wanted to just, um, like this was a very subjective perspective, this, this book, this is telling my story. I did my best to be fair, but it's been my story. And so I didn't, I didn't sort of dive in with my family too much along the way, I just picked up bits and pieces of, when I finished it all, I wanted to cross-reference to check my timelines are right and my memories are correct for these moments. And my brother, Sam, he remembered every single moment. Like I just wrote about this tiny moment where our parents left us at our grandparents for the first weekend on our own. We were like three and four sitting up in the, the windows saying goodbye as they drove out the window. He goes, I remember, I remember that. It felt like there was no love in the house. And it was perfectly described like what it's like when your parents go away for the first time. <laughs> and then there was this other moment soon after he'd already received and then I'd received. And um, it's one of, one of my favourite scenes in the book because it's where the doubts really just set fire in my brain. And um, he was there sort of beating away at his monosyllabic um, tongue, which just sounded so unconvincing. And he was just doing it louder over the top of all the parents who sounded much more like full languages, and he was just dying away with a single syllable thing. I was like, it's faking it, it's faking it. And I was just like, losing my shit. And so I, call, I called Sam, you know, Sam's father of four living in Switzerland now. He's, he's 39, I'm 41. And I called him, do you remember the grandparent moment? And I, and do you remember that prayer meeting where I was getting pretty kind of frustrated and angry? He goes, yeah, and I never knew why. I'm like, really? Because I just, I just could feel that my, my brother was angry with me. And so he never questioned it ever until it all blew up in our 20s. He just went with it. And he broke more of the rules than me. He, he didn't care about the rules. He just did whatever he could, whatever he could get away with, and just sort of got on with it. Whereas I had to sort of think things through. And if there was a, a question or a doubt, it would rattle around in my brain. And so... We, we remembered all the same plot points that we had a completely different read on it. The, there's a ton to that I know, and there's this, you know, I can see this pressure building up as you're getting through the book. You're like, you know, you're, you're talking about going up, you're in your teens, you're going, like, you're starting to meet, you know, you're, you're starting to be interested in girls, all that kind of stuff. Like how stretched did you feel between that world and, the, like, the I guess the, the non-revival um, centres world? Not that stretched as a teenager. I I was sort of able to navigate it. Like I had a really, you know, we had a great life in Mudgee, like a very, um, yeah, a close community, a lot's going on. We were playing footy, we were in musicals together. Like there was, everything was accessible and I was allowed to do all of that. I got reined in on my rep footy career because it was on Sundays, halfway through, um, you know. The Wallabies haven't, you know, looked the same since. But um, <laughs> look, I wasn't really going anywhere. I had too many concussions by that point anyway. <laughs> but um, it, it sort of didn't curtail me too much. It was, it was mostly just took up a lot of my time, meant that I couldn't have a girlfriend and I couldn't go through those sort of real bonding, drinking, partying experiences as a teenager. But otherwise it kind of worked. And I also had, I had this whole network of friends in Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney. I'd go to these camps. And so... The trade-off as a teenager was actually okay. And so by the time I got to the end of high school, I was like, I was always scared that my friends at school would kind of ridicule me for our beliefs, but actually everyone was fine about it. I mean, they didn't know. Only a few actually came along and saw the weirder parts of it. Um, yeah, but mostly I, I found this nice balance. And so by, by the end of high school, I, I didn't want to leave. And you go, I mean, this is like we were talking before, like, don't give away the book to that. Um, mm. There's a bit in there that I love, which is this, like, your first trip overseas. Yeah. Um, and you go on this, like, you know, bit of a drawing around the world. Um, like, New York? Did you... Yeah, I went, um, I got six weeks between the end of uni and my first job. So yeah. 
It was like a week in California, a few days in New York, and then a month in Europe. Yeah. And Classic you, backpacking trip. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, mate. And this is the, the thing that I find interesting about this, and I love the idea of you being terrified in LA. Read the book, it's great. Um, <laughs> New York, cool. Um, yeah. You go to Europe and mm. you meet, is it Bellin? Yeah. Is that, yeah. Um, and you can't, the, the trip's been pretty, you know, straightforward to that point. Mm. You stay with some of our mm. people in the UK. Yeah. Point, yeah. yeah. And then you, instead of going on your planned trip to the mainland um, on a flight, yeah. You meet this woman, where is she from? She's uh, from Madrid. Madrid. Um, the squatting in London. Yeah. yeah. And she's driving a van with some mates. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about the drive. <laughs> yeah. So I got a taxi into New York and I, someone with this nice looking woman looked a bit older than me. I was 20. She looked about 30 something. I want to share a taxi. Oh, you're on the same flight to London in a week. What a coincidence. We talk on the plane and she's like, yeah, I, I um, I've been traveling for a year. I live in a squatted apartment in Brixton in, in London with about five or six of my Spanish friends. We love raving. I'm like, okay, what's raving? And um, <laughs> she's like, well, we take ecstasy and go, go to parties all weekend. I'm like, oh, okay. She's like, yeah, like some of my friends um, broke into an office tower, um, broke down the front door brought in a sound system and we partied all weekend in this office tower and then we were rolled out Monday completely cooked as people were walking in <laughs> in their suits. I'm like, okay, right. And then she's like, and look, and yeah, from the outside, she was she was someone that the church would have said was a, a bad person. But she didn't seem like a bad person. She seemed like a good person. She had this really warm, open, caring sort of energy. And she said, um, you're meant to be going, you know, into into Europe from London from here. We're we're driving to Madrid. Why don't you jump in with us? We're all going to see our family for Christmas. And then I said yes. So I leave this <laughs> like quaint house in Wimbledon where some revival center friends are staying, where I was comfortable but soon bored. Catch a train at sort of five in the morning. Get out of the station at Brixton, and there's this van waiting for me with a bunch of absolute freaks in them. And I just get in and drive to Madrid. And it, it took us about, I think you can get to Paris, you can drive to Paris from London in, in six about hours. About half a day. Yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah. not long. Five, five hours, something. It took about 12. They took a long way, and yeah. it was chaos. And then we just go into someone's apartment, and it's full of French people smoking. Um, hash and they're playing like at 5 a.m. at Brixton Station. They already were ripping into basement jacks in the car. Like it was a strong scene. And um, I just surrendered to these people who were just so warm and lovely and free spirited. And it just, it just kind of absolutely blew my mind. And I just kind of had to let go. Like I was awkward. I was nervous. Like when we were on the, the ferry from um, Dover to um, Calais, I was sitting there and I've got my like, like neat blonde hair, a quicksilver kind of jacket, um, neat jeans. And I'm sitting next to this absolute bunch of freaks with like purple hair, like baggy clothing. And it really looked like I lost my family. Lost my parents. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so it was just three days. I remember like we were in the, um, crossing through the Pyrenees and we stopped in a bar and one of the guys was from that area. We knew all these people in the bar. We're just sitting there and I had my first few glasses of wine and I just leaned back against this old beautiful stone wall that probably had been there 500 years. I just had this connection between liberated contemporary culture and the history that was kind of was doing something for me. And I just sort of thought, I don't have to be the conscientious older brother. You know, I don't have to do all that. I can, I can be free. I can be fun too. Just sort of, my mind just started to open and change. Yeah. The thing that's always changed my mind about stuff that I've, if I've had an established view on something, the thing that changes my mind is meeting someone who challenges them basically. Mm. So you've grown up in this church which says you can't drink, you can't smoke. All the people that do that are terrible people, and mm. you meet these people, and they're wonderful. Yeah. Um. Yeah. When you know you come back to Australia, you're coming back to the revival centers. What are you thinking about the church? Yeah, well, I came back just full of this um, optimism and excitement and I wasn't up for their, their negativity anymore. But I quickly realised, like, marrying what I was feeling and my reality was going to be really challenging. And so 
initially I got back and um, my 21st birthday party was meant to be a few days later. And I just spent the last six weeks <laughs> doing whatever I wanted around Europe and kind of riding off the church in my head. But all these friends came in from other cities and I'm there at my 21st. Um, I thought, like, how am I going to break out of all this? Like it's going to mean losing all these people. And that's like, that's not going to be easy. It, it, in the abstract clarity that I've had overseas, it seemed empowering and exciting. And then I got back and had to face what it would mean to basically turn my back on all my friends and kind of shamefully, in their eyes, walk away. You talk about this, like the fact there are some people that love that global sort of citizen vibe, like they can kind of disappear into somewhere, and that that's actually not you. You're a like, person that loves a community and people around you. Well, community ends up being a bigger thing than I expected in the book because, yeah, I was so excited by that, that those global vibes and travelling and the people you need, and I, just, I didn't want to come back from that first trip. So eventually I leave my job at um, the investment bank where I got a job, so I went into that before I ended up having a career change. So there was a big transition going on for me with all that as well. Um, but I ended up moving to Amsterdam and... Um, yeah, it was from Amsterdam actually that I wrote um, my friend Anthony here an email. The, the, the tagline was Bohemia, let it rain, which he made into a t shirt eventually. <laughs> and that's when I was starting to just feel really free, but I also felt um, a little bit isolated. I remember just standing there in that apartment looking out and thinking, I don't know anyone here. And like part of that was super exciting, but after being there for almost a year, I realized that. For me, community was really important. And that also helped me, helped me realize that there were parts of my upbringing that I really loved, you know? And, and I sort of realized at different points in the many years after that, that lots of the choices I've made have been, have been going for that closeness, that sense of, of knowing people and, and community and, and connection. So yeah, my, my thinking kind of shifted around that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, that was the thing that I found sort of the most revealing about it, knowing you as well as I've known you for as long as I've known you. That idea of the community helps make a lot of the things that I know about you kind of click together. Mm. Um, you know, the Red Fern Party days, we'll get yeah. to it. I know it's been cut down, but we'll yeah. with Scott Mitchell about it. Um, <laughs> but the things that I, I want to, before we get to that, the thing I find really interesting, like you're, you're a journalist. Um, all of that's based around questioning stuff. And you, you know, it's not until... You know, you kind of get back from, I think, maybe a second Europe trip before you mm. really start to I kind of unpick the logic of the revival sentence. Mm. Um, why, did it, why did it take so long? It, yeah, so it, it was 21. I was 21 when I finally left, and then I went to a bunch of other churches after that because I thought, well, it's just the revival center that's got Christianity wrong. I still want to be a Christian, and I worked through a whole process of that as well, so... That's where I got to see um, other churches um, like C3, which is very similar to Hillsong and that side of Pentecostalism and got some exposure to that. Um, it took so long because I'm actually, and I've, I've learned this, when you, you write your own life story, which I've pretty much done, you start to see the patterns. And one of the patterns for me is that, you know, for all the, the colour and enthusiasm um, that I bring, and maybe you saw this in the hack days, I'm actually very careful and analytical. It's a sort of a strange mix where part of me has like a wild heart, but then part of me loves to get things kind of right and I, and I need to understand them. So my brother didn't need to break the, things into its parts, didn't need to analyse and dissect, whereas I needed to. And also because once I started really um, rocking the boat, it hurt. You know, I was alone. There was a, a six or 12 month period where I had this physical pain in my heart where I was feeling dislocated from my family, couldn't see the future, didn't know where I stood with it all, wanted this touch from God still after finally admitting that I hadn't really properly had it. And that was the solution I was hoping for. So I was pretty lost. And so for me, like I even, it took me two years to lose my virginity after leaving the church because that, because of the rule on fornication was the final cutoff. So because the reason it took me so long is like, that's the final cutting off point potentially from my family and that whole 
part of my life. And it's like looking back, it was almost irrational, but sort of rational. And so I was just, I was super careful. That's why it took so long. Like if I was actually rebellious, like it's just, it wasn't that I was rebellious. That's not the reason I rebelled. I rebelled because the church was so bad and the rules and the, the interpretation of the Bible was so wrong. And that was like a cancerous because it spread to all the different other rules and um, codes and culture of this organisation. Do you think that, like, do you, have, do you carry any kind of, like, guilt or worry for not interrogating it sooner? Hmm. Not really because, like, I had a friend write to me this week and um, he was in the church and the reactions to the book have been crazy from people who had any, anything like that sort of upbringing. They, they, they're they just, it's, a, it's so liberating for them to see someone else tell the story in public. They're absolutely loving it. And he said, it's going to bring a lot of sadness for me because I'm glad you got out when you did, but I got out like later, too late. He got out as like a mid, like mid-30s gay guy, you know? It's like you missed the chance to make all those important friendships you got to make in your 20s and, and 30s. Um, and so by getting out of 21, I feel okay about that. And I just don't think it could have, like, I, I wish, I wish, you know, if I could, I asked my mum about it and she said, I wish we left when the split happened. Um, that's when we, we had the good years. We had the children in the nice community. It started getting too hardcore. We should have pulled them in there. Um, but look, 21, I can live with that. Because I was happy with where my life got to. I wasn't, yeah, I'd probably be like, you know, kicking the tires a bit harder on some of those timelines. Yeah. Um, I love the way that you write. Like, I love the way you write about your mum, but I love your mum's reaction to so many things in the book. Mm. Like, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's just like, I'm thinking about it. Yeah. I can really see her just like kind of just tolerating it, being like, hmm, okay. Um, yeah. Which I found really interesting. Um, Red Flag Party Days, because mm. um, that's, that's such an opportunity. Look, I was talking to yeah. a mutual friend about Scott Mitchell and I was speaking the other day. Um, you know, you've been lamenting how much of the Red Front Party gets cut out of the book, apparently. Yes. Um, well, you have. So oh. that, was, that was a mistake <laughs> from Scott. So, yeah, um, yeah, that's what <laughs> that's, I mean. That's what we yeah. yeah. um, Neither do I, by the way. So, that's all right. <laughs> um, the thing that I find really interesting in that is that, like, you know, you, you've got, you leave the church and, you know, you start to kind of really live your life, basically. Not immediately. You, you build up to that point. And when mm. we would have met, which would have been, I guess, like early 30s, I think. I'm about not sure. 30, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I was saying, like, like we're talking about the start, like it's up to 11. Mm. Um, and you say in the book, and this is the the story that I always got was, well, yeah, like I was saying, Tom was part of this, you know, very restricted upbringing, and so it was just sort of letting off steam at that mm. point. And you, you can't, like, you, you argue in the book that that's not, like, it's just a continuation of your childhood. Mm. Um, like, do you, like, there's, there's an element of, the relaxation of those rules and the building of that community and like a kind of rush to make those friendships in there, though, right? So yeah, I mean, it's a funny one because I didn't. It wasn't like I flipped the switch and got got loose. Like um, it all just kind of built really slowly, which is um, so leaving at twenty one, go to Amsterdam, have a year away, kind of reset at twenty three sort of basically start again in the city of Sydney, um, kicking around the inner west, um, 20, 24 onwards, and sort of just built up slowly. And, yeah, we were, we were going to a lot of parties, but it, it just sort of slowly ramped up. And then getting the job at Triple J really helped me have a place, you know, which for a lot of us is a big part of what our career does for us and a career that I was proud of because I'd had a career that I was very embarrassed by in the bank. And so the I <laughs> got a whole other memoir on that actually. Um, yeah, and so my my sense of self, my identity, I, I was growing in confidence in my new life. But this is like 27, 28, you know, when probably you know people are starting to settle down at that age. But I feel like I was just just landing in the life that I I dreamed of in my late 20s. And then yeah, the, the first time I got to host, uh, did my first year of hosting, I got just turned 30, you know. So since I'm just just hitting it, I remember my 30th thinking, God, I'm only, I just feel like I'm getting started. Probably everyone's going to have kids, kids soon and it's, I'll be the, the only, you know, the oldest bloke at the party. Um, 
which turned out to be untrue. Um, <laughs> and yeah, then just, I don't know. Yeah, it just, it, it wasn't this violent sort of binary thing for me. It just kind of built slowly and just got to meet lots of great people and was really happy in my life. And um, partying for me was just an awesome way to meet people. And that was a big part of it. So there was that sort of community building aspect to it. But yeah, it's it's, not, it's an interesting open question. You used to talk about finding a tribe. Mm. Remember that? I'm, I've used some pretty embarrassing yeah. lingo. So <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't deny it. Yeah. <laughs> like, is that is that coming from the kind of community you're looking for? I think everyone probably wants that. I think that's like basic human nature. We, we started out in tribes, you know, and we will now live in this um, mostly urbanised global environment. Um, but everyone is still longing for that, that sense of connection and to be loved and to be cared for and to be understood. Um, so I think everyone wants that, but I was probably just a bit more conscious of it and put, put you know, silly phrases around it because I, I, I knew how important it was and I knew what it felt to be cast aside yeah. or to set aside yeah one of the things that you talk about actually quite early on um when you talk about the people that are forming the revival centers there's these kind of like you know older hippies that feel like being a hippie didn't live up to the hype mm -hmm. and they were looking for mm -hmm. something um and that was kind of a cause to grab onto do you, do you think that's still a driver to those kind of organized religions at the moment or people are going for something else well, that was a, the time I'm talking about, like it's kind of the 70s where, yeah, there was all this dissatisfaction coming out of Vietnam and a lot of social upheaval um, that sort of had the threat of um, nuclear war. That was very, very present in, um, in news, current affairs, media, um, a lot of cultural imagery at the time was sort of um, contextualised by this fear of Russia and America going to war and someone pressing the button. So, so that created a real intensity that I think drove a lot of people to these, these kind of religions and Pentecostalism went through a big big wave at that time because it offered something different um, to a lot of the more established religions. Um, what's driving people to religion now? Well, not much because they're leaving it. Well, that's the thing. Like, is it is it something that it, you know you've got these people that are, yeah people are still dis disillusioned. That's not a new thing. Yeah. And people are kind of you know you, you get attached to causes because of the the hype that's associated with them and this promise. And like most of the time, the promise isn't like never sort of actually comes out at the end. Yeah. Like, where are people like? Is it a spiritualism thing? Are people looking for other stuff? Is it tarot cards? I don't. I don't know where people are going to kind of meet those same needs now. Like I know, um, for me personally. Um, I sort of like there's there's ways in this, in you know secular life to get that deeper kind of fulfillment that I think are some of the way to what people can get from religion. So um, as we discussed, a good community is a really huge part of that. Um, I think some people get that that connection with the unknown and the the sublime and the awesome through a connection with nature. Um, and I still have this this kind of like I'm in love with the kind of big mountain stuff that, like in the last sort of 10 years or so and that when I sort of you know looking at the Alps or something like that it, it feels like just super powerful and literally awesome um, I also like I love reading history now and like to to learn that people at different points in time you know you would say in Yuval Harari's book Sapiens like going right back um that we're all sort of shooting for the same thing and trying to meet the same needs. Like feeling that connection with other humans throughout history gives me this sort of like a really sort of warm, connected feeling. So I think there are secular ways of hitting some of those notes. Um, but yeah, maybe not all of them. And I, I don't, I haven't, like I haven't done a huge amount of research outside the book yet. I'm sort of looking at other tangential sort of ideas going forward from here. Um, I don't know where people are going to sort of meet those needs otherwise. I don't know if there is a big new solution. Maybe it's the QAnon and the internet and all the like paranoia and, you know, joining in, yeah, having a, a strong opinion about vaccines or, I don't know. I mean, that's something that in some of the work that I've done is that's what it is. Like if there's a sense of belonging from that. And it's a really simple explanation, basically. Like it's in the same way that religion is this, oh, everything makes sense because of God. Mm. 
Mm. Um, you're like, oh, cool, right, God, got it. There was so much crossover between hardcore religious people and the conspiracy movement. It's this distrust, the paranoia, and as you say, a thirst for a simple answer. Like the, the, the QAnon thing has kind of got it all for people, which is, which is, I guess, why it's so powerful. So the internet kind of promises this sense of finding a tribe and community, but it's an absolute shit show. Do you still find company, God? No. Don't believe in him. Um, I mean, I don't want to. That's. I don't want to get too much into. Yeah, that's a. That's a, a part of the book that kind of very much surprises me. But um, comfort. I just try and. I guess the other thing that that I learned throughout this, and I, I touched on it briefly, is like understanding mental health. I also think that maybe moves into the religious space a little bit because often people are trying to meet those needs. Um, in religion, but actually, you know, they might have an anxiety problem or, or a problem with depression or or any kind of uh, mental health problem. Um, so for me, I think it's a it's a balance of when you're struggling, it's managing your own mental health so that you're in the right state to deal with challenges, and then I then I try and solve them, you know, and understand what I can and can't control. So you you're not beating your head against the wall, losing your mind, but just try and be in a happy place and and actually deal with deal with problems, yeah. Rather than I guess sitting there and hoping that um, an external force might do it for you. Do you are you still looking for anything at the moment? Now, not necessarily God, but just like any sort of purpose or anything like that. Do you find yourself missing something that you had back in the Bible Center days that you're still trying to fill a hole up? I got to the point of writing this because I was, I hit this point of satisfaction, like those years you were talking about. Um, I was so happy with the, the cards that had eventually been dealt after sort of, you know, dropping some of the jokers um, <laughs> that, that I felt fairly satisfied with this mix of, you know, having good people in my life, having career and drive and purpose and, and you know, a few other things. And so, no, now, like, um, Amanda and I have just had our first child, Maxwell, and I know that being a dad is going to be so all-consuming. Like, it's already so much harder than everyone told me. <laughs> <laughs> well, they tried, but you couldn't quite understand, and it's such an intense challenge. So, for one, I can see the smiles here from <laughs> anyone who's had children. Um, you know, and, and we would like to have more children so that's that's going to be so all-consuming and fulfilling and wonderful and yeah i'm lucky enough to feel like i have good good people in my life um from old friends to new friends to family um and so yeah the the, the challenge is mostly actually in the in the career space just keep keeping things keep kicking along and, and have a fulfilling career and amongst all of that right <laughs> i've got a few i've got a heap i keep going but there's questions as well. So, has anyone got a question for Tom? Yeah. Did you, uh, the rest of your family leave the church? Can't give that away. Can't give that away. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, because yeah, everyone asks me when I sort of tell them the basics of the story. So, what happened to the family? And um, yeah, you, I don't think I think I'd um diminish the reading experience to answer that question. Yeah. So, where does the revival center still influence you today? Yeah, look, I, I'd love to tell myself that it, it didn't, that I was clear of it, that, you know, um, it's now it's almost exactly 20 years since I left now, so half my life in, half my life out. Um, but through writing the book, I realised there were parts of logic that I would apply to different situations that were actually um, shaped by the Revival Centre. So, um like when I was making a big decision about when to leave for Triple J, for example, which you were in and around, um, I was like, oh, if I do it, do it wrong, then this might happen, blah, 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 and then my career will fall off a cliff and I'll be destitute, you know? Um, or, or relationships, you're in a relationship where you're not sure what to do and you're like, oh, if I, if I break up, and you know? So I had this kind of like slippery slope doomsday kind of logic, and that was for someone who... Had lots of agency 
and energy and, and track record of doing well, you know? And so it was only through writing the book that I realized, oh, that, that pattern was the pattern you were told about going to hell. It's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, that's not gonna happen. I'm not gonna let that happen. My family's not gonna let that happen. And so I was able to pick apart some of the logic that still sat with me. So, you know, the, the slippery slope arguments and you, we sort of have to unpick them in, in journalism a bit as well. It's like, it's often nonsense. Like, the slope's not that slippery, you know, because you can realise you make mistakes and you change course. Just because you make one, you're not going to suddenly start sliding away into a pit of hell. And so I didn't realise that was, because the context was so different from, you know, salvation and in the spiritual space through just making life decisions, I didn't realise that that logic had sort of been baked in, you know, in, in that kind of space. So, yeah, I unpicked a few things like that. Um, then I guess... Yeah, just the, I've then tried to hang on to some of the good parts of it and sort of keep, keep them in my life. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was mostly about the community stuff, particularly for kids. And I'm wondering, like, you know, I would love Maxwell to be surrounded by kids that he related to and felt supported by. So I'm looking for that more in, a, in the family and the secular, in normal kind of life, you know, outside of, so that he, he doesn't, go into this beautiful community and one day face the reality of getting booted out of it, you know, just like real people that you can be a part of. So that's the, that's the main thing that I want to kind of recreate from, from the church. Yeah? Just a question about when you might have challenged your own values around conservative political um, opinions, such as queer or abortion, like in the US at the moment. Like, would that a big thing for you to overcome, I think, or were, were there challenges around that? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, different issues came up around the church and um, social, socially conservative views. Um, you know, I'm on Triple J, which is sort of known for being more youth orientated and progressive. And um, it was Catholic World Youth Day in about 2008, and tens of thousands of people came over. The Pope was here, he comes in on a, you know, a cruiser, you know, boat into the harbour and did a, did a good scene if you're a Catholic. And, um, so classic journalism um, approach. Let's do a series on all the most controversial parts of the Catholic Church. So one day it was like contraception. The next day it was abortion. The next day it was something else. So we just like um, sort of rethought a lot of this since. But um, I just went out and like grilled Catholics on their most like controversial views. <laughs> all these people just trying to nice hot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just trying to get a view of the Pope. And I'm there just like grilling them about abortion. So, um, yeah, and then and then the other, and so partway through I realised that I thought I was, you know, very impartial and I'd sort of um, become conscious of my biases and unpack them so that I approached everyone fairly. That was a big deal for me. Like I was very always very conscious, you know, probably painfully so, that the, the taxpayers were, were paying for our show and our station and paying our salaries, and we need to give a fair representation of all. And we have a lot of regional listeners as well, whereas a lot of our colleagues were um, in a city kind of crew who didn't necessarily get that. You, you worked in Karatha, so you kind of got it a bit more than some of our colleagues, but I knew conservative people, I knew country views, and I knew they were a big part of our audience and a part of our taxpayers. So I was very serious about trying to land the show in the middle. Um, but yeah, I realized I was like going really, going really hard on these, these Christians and that was not cool. And it wasn't, I left the church to be a better person, you know, not to be a hater that just slammed someone whose views were different from mine. So I had to walk back my biases even more and not become a hater of religion. And, um, very, that was very important. Um, and then it almost swung the other way where um, it got really challenging during the same-sex marriage plebiscite. So we, there were people that think that anyone that says, you know, had the no perspective on that debate was a homophobe that should be not be given any airtime on any platform whatsoever. That was a pervasive view. And I've, I found that much too hard line and, and cancelling a whole section of the Australian community out of that debate. And so um, I sort of came full circle, whereas as someone who actively chosen to walk away 
from the church, almost like a defender of religious freedom. Um, you know, the Israel flower thing again was, you know, I I don't think he should have, you know, him expressing a Christian view shouldn't have cost him his whole career. Like I, I get the harm that that could do to an individual, but but we've got to trade off harm and offence versus free speech and freedom of religion, which I think is very important and our, our society is founded on. So these issues get really, really tricky, but, you know, I've, I've ended up with some views that people might, might brand as conservative, but it's just like I sort of understand those communities mm-hmm. and those people, even though I really disagree with them. Um, they all have to be given space to put their views forward if, if we're going to call this a civilization. Um, just a question for you, having left the, the, the church and had a more open life um, mm. experiences, the, the opportunities that have come with that, and you look back at people who have stayed, do you feel like they've, do you feel sad for them because their opportunities are limited or do you feel um, that because they have that certainty and they have that comfort that they're winning for them? Um, well, for- in the case of our church in particular, it's gone from sort of around 5,000 to around 700. And so I'm not stoked for that. Yeah. I think that's a bit of a, a small pond to be flapping around it. Um, what I would love for them, if they still truly believe in Jesus and believe in God, I would like for them to go and join a big, healthy, supportive Christian community if that's what they, if that's, if, if they still truly believe. Um, and so for anyone that's a believer and they're part of a healthy Christian community, fantastic, and I'm happy for them. But if you're in a small group that's got some really unhealthy characteristics, then I, I do feel sorry for them, yeah. Um, yeah, I kind of, I've lost a lot of good friendships, um, occasionally run into them again and, yeah, ended up speaking to one of my really old friends just to see if he'd let me use his name and he's still deep, deep in it. And yeah, it was a really, he was lovely. He said, you go for it, mate. You put my name in there. It's, it's your perspective. The church was a bit hardcore back then, and I think it's better now. And um, it's your perspective. I'm you know, not going to stop you from wanting to tell your story and go for it. So quite a beautiful response, you know, from someone who's stayed a part of that and is a great person. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, point of um, writing your uh, that book, mm. um, have you been able to couch different personalities into people that will not feel uh, aggrieved, if you like, by your writing, or how have you actually gone about writing about real people? I guess. So do you mean the, the people in particular who sort of take actions that are maybe um, can yeah. be yeah more yeah. critical. Um, so probably the person yeah I've changed some of the names. Um, the the names of the pastors are their real names because they're people who chose to stand up and take a position of authority and take those actions. Um, the most controversial character in this book is a guy called Jeff Bates. And um, that's not his real name. And that was my decision because I think he made some mistakes and went a bit too far. Mm -hmm. And I ended up in a good place in my life and I'm not looking to punish him with this book in any way whatsoever. But that was just a key element of my story, my interactions with this person. So um, yeah. Gave him a bit of leeway with the name and just tried to write it as, as fairly as possible and just let the let the story give the colour and the tone and not sort of make a judgment. So this is what happened. Obviously, there is a sense of judgment and it's all in your control because you're the writer and you're choosing the context and which anecdotes make the cut and, and which don't. Um, been really sort of engaged with my dad. So, you know... He was the big decision maker in our family that took us in a lot of these directions. And so I showed him excerpts of the book before I signed the publishing deal to see if he 
how he felt about it. Um, and they've been really supportive and open. And then I showed them a draft before we sort of got down to the final stages and gave them a chance to give feedback, changed a couple of small things for them. They didn't want too much change, they, they liked it. Um, yeah, so I think sort of there's leaving little bits of managing kind of people, but just trying to be in as raw but as fair as I can. Um, we've actually got a couple of Zoom questions as yeah. well, if I can. Um, so from Renee, what advice would you give to anyone else thinking of leaving such a sect? <sighs> <laughs> my advice to you is that, and I actually thought about several times in my own story, what, what would I have said to myself if I went back at various stages and if it was, if a, 41 year old Tom had turned up and said, Get out of there, mate, you're a bunch of losers. I would have probably not received that very well. So, like to over prescribe can be can feel kind of wrong. So, I just want to tell people who are dealing with that that it will all be okay. And I kind of want that to be the message of my book that it's like you'll feel lost, you feel like you won't be able to see your future. Your, the key relationships in your life will be in flux and that will be deeply disconcerting for a time. But trust yourself, work through it step by step if you need to. And that, that was another key element of my story that I was sort of trying to get across early. That I, I just took it one tiny step at a time, which is why I was a virgin for so long. Um, but yeah, I would just want to reassure them that everything can turn out fine, just work through it, it's a process. Um, we've also got a question from Ruben, who also grew up in a CRC community. Okay. Um, he said that as a child, it scared the shit out of him, like a lot of the speaking in tongues. Mm. He asks, um, did you ever sort of feel scared or disturbed as a child? No, not really. It was like, yeah, it was mostly a warm, nice environment, except, yeah, sort of the, you know, slowly accumulating fear that, you might not receive and then become an outlier. But apart from that, being in there, I didn't think it was scary. Yeah. Um, question on the back? Uh, Tom, I think God on the make this. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> why did you write? What's, I mean, you, you're you a deep thinker, you undertake a big task. What was the point behind all this? Um, Well, on, on, a, on a basic level, there's, I, I feel like a lot of us human beings, depends on the kind of personality you are, but it's it, there's just an urge to share the challenging, the big challenging moments of our life. And I think that's what builds culture and builds learning. So there was a basic urge to share this, but for many years, I was sort of embarrassed by it. Like I didn't, I didn't want it to be on the front end of my identity in, in those years in my 20s and 30s. And when I was a teenager, I was sort of like trying to keep it behind closed doors. And yeah, then when I got to a stage where I felt very satisfied with where things had ended up, I thought, well, if that's part of what got me to a good place, why be ashamed of it, you know? And I think some of the some of those experiences inform my journalism as well. Like, I'd like to think that it helped me um, offer real empathy for our for our listeners and our people sharing their stories or that the analytical part of my brain was sharpened by having to pick apart um, this doctrine and this culture and um, this re religious view. And yeah, and I didn't write it for altruistic reasons, but I do hope that, you know, for people who, like the person who just asked that question, that it offers hope for people who are questioning a really intense religious community or, or any situation they grow up in, it might even be their sexuality, um, that the life they're born into or that they're expected to lead doesn't fit for them. And so I hope it offers a bit of encouragement for anyone in, in any situation that doesn't feel right for them. Yeah. Well, pretty, pretty deep, isn't it? It's pretty intense. <laughs> <laughs> pretty earnest on a Thursday. Okay, what day is it? It's all right to be earnest on a Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the night where we've had our house meetings, so you know, they're usually about this size. <laughs> One of my friends is like, you should you should start your own cult. You'd be really good at it. I do need an idea for my second book. <laughs> like a fiction. That's what I was going with you know, looking for. I can yeah, see that. Basically, the second book. Yeah, yeah. That was pretty strong. Well, I'm getting tons of people reaching out to me just going, 
this is you telling my story and it's not necessarily even a rival center it's like assemblies of god or all these other pentecostal groups um so yeah i can scoop them all up and start something <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, so we might leave it there. So thank you. We'll do a huge round of applause for Thanks so much. Thank you. Alrighty, guys. So the book's available inside if you want to head in. And um, oh, wait, can we just get a photo with the crowd behind us? Would you guys like sure. taking, our, taking our selfie? Yeah. <laughs> Coming selfie as well? Actually, would you mind? I'll take it. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we can sit in the front row.